Well, good morning. I am so pleased to have you here as my guest today, Gigi. And so Gigi, you are a professor at Baker University. You also have some pretty amazing things going on in your life that I would like for you to tell us what the name of your foundation is and also how to pronounce your name. I'm going to be calling you Gigi during the whole interview, which is what you go by. Uh, but would you please tell us your name, where you're from, and well, and then get right into how, what you do and for how long. Um, my name, my full name is pronounced um, Ejiro Uriya Osiabe. Um, <laughs> the name of my family's foundation is the Ane Osiabe International Foundation. Um, it's it was based in Nigeria because that's where my my mom and my descendants are from Nigeria, and some few um, this year 2020 we, we we migrated we relocated to the U.S. So now the foundation runs and functions as a U.S. nonprofit. Um, how long have I been in the industry? I've been an economist for I think going to 17 years, and the reason why I'm counting it as 17 years is. Um, I'm thinking about when I started doing anything related to economics, which is from my undergrad. So this was back in 06. So from 06 is um, when I started working on economics as a field of study, and I started in, uh, implementing economic theories into my daily lives. So, well, I think I've been doing that for a while, especially because in my mind, I, I played a lot of Monopoly with my mom, and economics is literally the game of Monopoly. <laughs> about it in a way yes. <laughs> i know yeah if you don't think about it that way but you're really good at playing the game of monopoly understanding economics demand and supply would really catch up with you because it's kind of the same thing yes that's great i love that we, we have a game at action coach called leverage which we teach people um and that's something maybe we can have our students do Yes, yes. It'd be not? fun to watch them play and learn at the same time. Uh, good. I love that. Okay, so 17 years. Um, and I, it's it's a great story, so I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. So how would you describe uh, who you help in your foundation? Tell us a little bit first about what you do at, at Baker, because I'm interested in that. And then uh, tell us um, what you do with your foundation. Um, so my foundation is uh, it's a developmental foundation. And we aim at human capital and economic growth, right? Which is very related to what I got my PhD in, which is we invest in, hum uh, in human capital, which is people. So when it was based in Nigeria, what we did was we paid for scholarships. Um, we paid for back to school packages for students. And, you know, we tried to connect students with universities because my dad um, worked at NUC, National University Commission. We tried to connect students to get admission into different affordable universities in Nigeria. And so that's what the foundation is really aimed at, right? Economic growth based on human capital. At Baker University, I teach economics, business information system, data analytics, and data projects. And other than the classes, and um, I, I also I, I just took over two new um, two new um, classes, which is intro to entrepreneurship and venture capitalism. Oh, wonderful! Yes. So out of these classes that I teach at Baker, what uh, me and my department chair, Dr. Judy, we've been working on since August is to create a business incubator at Baldwin which connects students with academic and also connects students with um, people in the mainstream economy so they could start local businesses at all. So that's kind of the overall, that's what I do in my everyday life, right? It's either I'm working on these topics with the, with the foundation or on the flip side, I'm teaching what I do with the foundation at Baker, Baker University, while also creating this new business incubator down there. I love that, but I feel like the, the two, uh, support and uh, undergird each other, right? Yes. That's wonderful. Ah, that's great. Let's talk about how you would describe your best customer. So I would describe my best customer just as the way I would describe, um, you know, the best, uh, a best someone that I, I deal as a good person, right? Which would be someone that understand um, that things happen in life and they try to be, be the best version of themselves. So if you think about um, when you're studying a business, when even as a professor, right, I just read my students, I just read my students um, evaluation. And after reading everything, I said to myself, okay, um, what can I do next semester that, could, that I could adjust so that they don't think this way 
or how can I meet them where where they are, are right? So that's how I that's how I describe my best person, right? And it's really it's really tied on to the to the statement of Teddy Roosevelt, right? The man in the arena. And the reason why I say that is, you know, sometimes you read your student review and what you did and how they interpreted it is just so different from your intention, right? So you think about this as a business person, right? I don't think any business, um, think about think about restaurant business or clothing industry or tech industry. No one sets out to, well, maybe some people, but most times nobody sets out to make people sad. But while their daily lives are going on, and they're juggling the business, the finance, and different areas, they tend to make mistakes, right? And in Teddy's statement, right, and everybody's quick to critic, right? So, and that's why I really like the man in the arena that says, you know, it's not a critic's account, uh, it's not a strong man, it's not a man who points out when the strong man stumbles or where the doers of deeds would have done better, right? The credit belongs to the man that's actually in the arena, right? And so if you can picture that man in the arena or woman, um, in the arena, striving to work hard to achieve their goal, they're always going to make errors, right? They're always going to come short again, again, and again. And that's okay when you're doing your business, right? They, they, when someone makes a mistake, it's not it's not nice for people to just pounce on them and say, well, you did this wrong, I would have done better. But you know, you would have done better, that's true. But the reason why you would have done better is because now, you see the mistake that they didn't see when they were starting. It's almost like a joke, right? Someone comes up on stage and they try to crack a joke without testing the joke at a comedy at a comedy um, bar. When you crack the joke with the wrong group of people, everybody's like, right? <laughs> but in the person's mind, the person thought that that joke was gonna make everyone happy and smile, right? Well, rather than pounce on the person and say, you told a bad joke or you told an offensive joke, kind of look at the person like, I kind of see where you were heading. But you need you have a lot of work to do, right? So that's why I like the man in the arena because of that statement that you know no one is going to start a business and going to get it right all the time. Absolutely, and, and I, I I'm, I'm impressed that you're able to recite the man in the arena. I can tell that. So you and I have have, have it here in front of us. Um, w- would you mind reading it? That yeah. way, it's in the interview in print. Yeah, in yeah, yeah. Entirety. So, so, so the full the full statement is: it's not the critics who count it's not the man who points out where the strong man has stumbled or where the doer has did would have done better the credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena whose face is mirrored with dust sweat and blood who strive violently who errs who comes short again again and again because there is no effort without errors or shortcoming but who does actually strive to do the deeds who knows great enthusiasm to great devotion, who spends his self or herself with a worthy cause, who at the best knows that he he ends in triumph of high achievement, and who knows at the worst he fails, at least fails while while daring great um, greatly, right? So his his place shall never be with those cold and timid soul who souls who yeah. needed no victory nor defeat, right? And that that tells a lot, right? If um, and anytime, you know, um, there's this guy at my university, he's a vice president, Nate Hauser. And so Nate, Nate, Matthew and I, we talk a lot about EPL and soccer. And so there was one day we were talking in his office and then I see the man in the arena, the, the, the statement on his wall. And I was like, you know, I actually have that in my home office. I should actually get that in my, at my Baker office because it's always good to remind you, especially when you make a mistake, right? You're talking to this person, you're working with this person, in your mind, you think this is how, you know, it's almost like the the Beetle project I'm working on at Baker, right? You know, I'm connecting this group of business people, I'm talking to this group of business people. In my deepest desire is to help the Baldwin community grow, right? And sometimes whenever I'm talking to Dr. Judy, I usually say, if this doesn't work out, this is gonna have a huge right a huge right and that's the whole idea of the man in the arena right your whole intention is good but you know <laughs> sometimes it doesn't work out as 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 you as you imagine it in your mind and it, it's usually because of you know we have blind spots and you know we also have um we also have areas that we do not see 
we do not see that we should have put into our equation when building a model. Right. There is so much in in the in that paragraph of the man in the arena. I've seen books written around it. I've seen whole entire coaching programs developed from this. Like, you know, <clears throat> and yeah, I, I love it. I'm really glad you you included that and read it because I think it's important. I think I need to have it on my office wall too. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Thank you for that. Um, so for the foundation, were there any business changes that you had to consider an, a necessity because of COVID? So a necessity, what the major necessity we had is during the COVID period, the whole business environment changed globally. And as the business environment changed global, globally, the first thing I thought of was, what is the best thing I can do to protect the foundation? Because the, like, the, the economy in the U.S. was totally different from the economy in Nigeria. Two different economies. Mm -hmm. And I was navigating two different economies mm -hmm. simultaneously. And at that point, I said the best move was for the foundation to relocate, to permanently move into the U.S. as a U.S. you know, 501 dream profit. And so one thing we had to do was to rent a big field and every high school or primary school, which is uh, any every high school or primary school we had promised to give back to school materials that we had approval, we had to invite them. And while inviting them, we couldn't get the students to come because, you know, it was COVID lockdown. Mm -hmm. So we could only work with um, the principal that would send a representative. And so we gave all the books we had bought, all the back to school materials to the principals. And um, with the hope that once the school opens, they will give it to those students that actually need those materials. Mm -hmm. um, we're still open to giving scholarship for schools but I think right now the foundation is navigating towards only giving standard U.S. standardized tests like the SATs, the okay. GREs, the mm -hmm. TOEFL as the standardized test that we pay for. Because in that way, since they are, since it's easy for the foundation to work with those companies since they're here in the U.S., mm -hmm. the the amount of meetings and transaction costs would literally reduce. Mm -hmm. So those were the major changes with, with me. And now the foundation. Um, We'll be working with rural, rural small communities in the U.S. with research, economic development, and stuff. I like that <clears throat> it, that you're looking at the rural because such a need there. So that's great. I think that's good. Uh, so, so you've been a, you've been in business, a business owner, um, foundation involved, and in all of the things. I, I feel like when you're a professor, you own your business because you have to. You know, you're, you're running a business of education and you're right. So what's been the biggest learning that you've had since you've been a business owner and involved in the foundation? Um, even So I like how you put it as a professor, because what I usually tell people that a professor of a class is somewhat like a manager, right? Yes. Because you have to take care of all these people you're teaching. And when you think about it, so let's imagine you're teaching a class of 20 students. So human IQ goes between from what level, right? So let's, let, let me be very generous, right? Um, 90 to 150, right? Right. So you're teaching a group of students that have an IQ level of 90 to 150. So that means the learning capacity of each student is different. And so now you have to put all of them as a single avatar to present to a class. So you're gonna meet the need of those that are in the 90 um, group and you're also trying to meet the needs of people in the 150 group, right? That wants to move as fast as lightning, right? And then mm -hmm. you're telling them that, listen, um, the class can only move as fast as the slowest person in the class. And so you're, so there's this dance going on back and forth when you teach a class that a lot of people don't know happens behind the scene. So um, same thing with the business, right? One, one client you're talking to, they don't want you to call them. They just want emails straight to the point. And it's because of they're very busy, right? They're like, I've given you this job. You said you would get it done on this day. I'm not going to speak to you till the deadline. And then there's another client that you work with that they would call you every single day. They would send you a text even on Super Bowl Sunday, right? Sure. Sure. <laughs> right? And so now how do you how do you set your boundaries between, oh, this, and you know, it's not nice for you to tell the client that, really likes communicating to be like, well, my other clients don't call me. Well, 
these are two different people these are two different businesses right so the major thing i learn every day which is to always correct my models like you know like i said i read my full student review yesterday every single word that everyone said and i asked myself okay out of these critics what areas can i improve in right so it's like you know ever try ever fail no matter try again fail again feel better so i live by that <laughs> i live by that slogan right which I love is like, that. yeah because <laughs> imagine imagine if i corrected my whole class based on this review i just read that is going to meet the exact students that just wrote this review guess who i'm going to be teaching that semester right group of people that needs a totally different thing so yes this review makes sense for these people that have moved on but now i have to think about this new group and it's actually even more tricky when there's a generational shift all right so now we're now we're teaching mostly gen z in about eight years it's going to be a total different generation that knows nothing about tiktok so then again you're gonna then again you're gonna try to change to sure. meet this new generation yeah. and their needs where they are so there's this ever trying ever failing no matter trying again failing again huh. feel better so there's that there's that dance and you know most importantly you can't make humans do what they don't want to do that was a hard long lesson that i had to, especially i think the foundation taught me that lesson very well especially when we were working on the farm right it is do this do this do this and then and everybody's like yeah 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 yeah, yeah we hear you and then they cut the line and then by the time i see the video of the farm they did exactly nothing that i said <laughs> <laughs> and then they'll tell me this is better for where we are right you don't know what is going on you're not on the ground you're just looking at us through a video phone and at that point I just, you know, I changed it from do this to what do you think you guys intend to do? And then they'll tell me. And then if I don't like it, I would ask them, tell me why you're intending to do it this way. Right? It's, so it wasn't, so I had to learn, I had to learn that shift that, okay, there's really nothing you can do sometimes in some environment, but just be like, hmm, tell me why you're thinking it, thinking about it this way. And, you know, sometimes you just have to stand back and, just as the way I learned with my failures, you have to learn them learn with your own failures mm -hmm. sometimes. And it's kind of painful sometimes when you're watching it happen because I know how the story ends. <laughs> well, you know, you know the answer, but they aren't, t you know, so, but l like, uh, I love the, the phrase, questions are the answers. They yeah. are, they are, and that's what you just said. So I asked the question, I asked another question to clarify uh, and, ha and to help that person who's answering the question uncover their thoughts too, you know, so. Ah, what a great story. Um, uh, okay, so this interview will also be in, in print, so in, in, in a newsletter. We also want to offer you any, in, if you would like to put anything in the newsletter as an offer, we will put that in there for you. What would you like us to do for you? Can we? Um, I would like, I would really like to promote um, what um, my colleagues and I at the Department of Business and Economics are working on, right? Under the leadership of Dr. Judy, right? At Baker University, which is, we are starting the Baker Economic Development Office, right? And its its main goal is to help local businesses, entrepreneurs in Baldwin City, right? And the university has, you know, has decided to start an annual Baldwin Economic Development Outlook Conference every year, April which brings business owners in Baldwin, neighboring community from Lawrence, from Wichita, from Topeka. And, you know, just to create this business synergy that helps that rural community grow. Because Baldwin has a lot of potential and we are trying to see how we can bring um, the students' ideas and, you know, um, the local business owners down there, you know, help them scale their business and also start exporting their products to other states and even outside the US. So that is the major goal of the Beetle project that we've been working on. And the, there's a conference that's scheduled um, in on April the 5th of 2023. Yes, April the 5th, 2023. Okay. And then that how would be the yeah. I was gonna say you're gonna give us information on how to find out more about that too. Yes, we would. Um, so the basic goal is um, we would start advertising the conference um, I think the first day of February and get people to RSVP. And um, at the end of, at the end, so the, the overall goal, other than the conference and the 
the incubator were also studying um, the Beetle Economic Bulletin. And the aim of that bulletin is to write, you know, this, uh, you know, it's kind of a business analytical report of all. So we're going to analyze each industry involvement, look for the strengths, look for potential, and post it at the university library for business people to see, okay, what, how can this benefit my business if I move to the Baldwin community? So that's what the whole project my colleagues okay. and I were all working on. Okay, wonderful. Um, all right. So, uh, what what do you find most inspiring? Uh, by the way, did, I've just called you Gigi because we've met outside of the professional. Yeah. Or do they call you Doctor Gigi at? Uh, I think everyone calls me Gigi because my dad is Doctor Siobe. Okay. <laughs> okay. And he's still <laughs> and and he's still alive. So all it's right. kind of weird. We so you know sometimes people call me Doctor Siobe and it's like. Uh, that's my dad. That's my dad, right? So, <laughs> I, so right now I go by Gigi. Okay. Right. Maybe when I stop looking this young, then maybe Doctor <laughs> Skelton will be too. Well, for the main part, <laughs> I'll, okay. I'll tell you this. I'll tell you this funny joke, right? I was telling this to my sister, and I had this student. Um, his name is Malachi, and after I taught the first class, he walks up to me and he said, "For a second, he thought I was about to pull Catch Me If You Can in front of the classroom." So there's a movie about Catch Me If yes. You Can, and Leonardo DiCaprio plays a fake professor for a very long time <laughs> in his class. And then he was like, he actually thought that's what I was doing. I was like, no, no, I don't think. That's I don't funny. think people go out of their ways to do that with a data analytics or a, <laughs> or an econ class. Maybe other easy classes, but not this not one. This one. <laughs> oh, that's great. That's great. Well, uh, so what do you find most inspiring about uh, about the foundation, about your business? Um, the foundation, so the foundation, I'll tell you how it started, right? So my mom passes away 2014. Um, we go through this lengthy back and forth before she could get buried. So she, I think she dies on her birthday um, in the month of June. We don't bury her till like, I think the second week of December mm. that year. So it was, it has a lot to do with tradition and different things, right? And which was just painful on my side. And so while my mom was alive, she always got, she always gave out back to school stuff um, to, to people that she didn't know because she, she taught in high school. But when she would go to, when she goes to teach, you'll see some students with no books, you see students with no backpack. And um, because of my dad's line of business, whenever he goes for conferences and goes for different things, we had so many books in our houses, so many backpacks that nobody would use, you know? And so my mom would be like, if you wouldn't use this, someone out there would use mm -hmm. it, right? Uh, if you wouldn't wear these shoes, um, I'll take it and give it to someone that will wear mm -hmm. the shoes, right? And so, you know, sometimes we, when she sees that we don't use something for a long time at home, she would take it out to go get. And um, the rest of us as kids, we never, we never did a lot of giving, right? It's like, oh, okay, you, you do. And so then when she passed away, um, that her first uh, year anniversary of passing away, I was really sad and I was just like, you know, kind of depressed. And, you know, um, and th this happened in Wichita, right? <laughs> um, the foundation actually started in my, in my, my little room when I was a master's student in Wichita. And so I pick up a piece of pen and a paper and I start writing, right? I start writing what are the goals, uh, what, are, what are the aims? and Everything I started writing down just sounded exactly like what my mom would have done, mm. right? Um, I would give out free books while well, she did that. Uh, backpacks, she did that. I would pay for standardized exam for people that actually have the potential to do well, but can't pay for these exams. And so I just literally took all her ideas and created this foundation. So the only part of me that is in the foundation is the you know, using econo economic terms like human capital, economic growth, economic development. But technically, if we remove the economics and the economic terms, they were kind of our, our ideas that I just modified. And, mm. and you just put a put a bow on it. Yeah, I just put a bow on it. It's like that's so, so nice. Yeah, what a wonderful so, thing to do in her memory too. Yes, that's wonderful. Ah, oh, that's a great story. Uh, so let's talk about your book, Female Education, A Way Forward. Tell us about that. Uh, so this is a book uh, my uh, we wrote in 2020 during the pandemic. And the primary aim of this book, and it's free online, the primary aim of this book is to 
give a um, highlight of what women in Nigeria have done, right? Amazing women, right? So, so I delved deep and I was looking at the achievement of what women in Nigeria have done. And some of them I knew growing up, like, you know, um, Dr. Dora of NAPDA mm -hmm. in terms of the drugs, right? Um, back in the days, they used to be, um, they used to sell fake drugs. And, you know, imagine someone um, falling sick of malaria, going to a pharmacist, trying to buy these drugs. And after you spend all your money buying it, it's fake. You know, you're buying like a, like a placebo. There's nothing in there, right? And so the person ends up dying for the disease. And so when, Dor when Dr. Dora took over, she, as the minister of, of, of NAVDA, she, she fought it and she, you know, she got rid of that in the country because it is just, it's just a painful sight to see, especially, and again, um, according to the World Bank, there's so many people in Africa that live below $2. Well, now it's now a dollar, um, 50 cents. Back it was a dollar, right? Because of inflation, it's now a dollar and 50 cents. So let's be generous below $2 a day. If that, if someone lives below $2 a day and they go buy, um, medication that is worth maybe seven dollars or ten dollars and that's a fake and that's a placebo mm -hmm. that's not the real deal literally the person spent maybe three days food to mm -hmm. buy a medication mm -hmm. right so you think about opportunity cost right so some some members of the family might not eat so that this member of the family doesn't die and so they do it and then they bought the fake drug and the person dies no. So um, that's a huge achievement um, that woman um, actually accomplished. And then there's um, um, the, the twenty uh, I said dollar <laughs> the twenty naira bill. There's a lady. There's a lady. Um, I think it's at the back of the front. Her name is Lady Kwali, mm -hmm. right? And she's a famous um, potter. And you know she she was known internationally for creating all these famous art pots. And she would sell it in 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 the in the US, in um, in Europe, and that is, you know, you think about um, the art, right? The painters and different group of people, that is someone that should be celebrated for, you know, exposing her art to the rest of the world. Then currently, this lady, she's still alive. She's the CEO of World Health Organization, Dr. Okonje, right? And mm -hmm. that is, an, that like, you know, she's an economist, so yay for economists. <laughs> she's an economist. <laughs> And uh, she has done great things. I, I read a lot of her, her written works, right? Especially when I'm working on a project, right? I would go, I would type her name on Google Scholar or ResearchGate, and I would like to read to see her opinion on a topic before I can drop my own opinion, right? That is a great scholar that is out there that is representing um, women in Nigeria that they don't celebrate. And um, one of my famous, um, one of my favorite and famous one that is under underappreciated is Queen Amina and you know she's from the northern side of Nigeria right and she helped defend her dad's kingdom during um during a war which was um oh, my hands is up I don't know why <laughs> she helped <laughs> she helped defend um she helped defend um her, king, her, her dad's kingdom during a war and this happened way way before Nigeria even got their independence but this happened even before the British people came into Nigeria. This is a this is an amazing story that people don't talk about. And you know, the whole kingdom was saved by a woman. Mm. And so this yeah, and so this book highlights different achievements of different women in Nigeria from different regions. And I just, you know, if you like if young girls in Nigeria can see themselves in this in this women, I just felt that, you know, that's what the book was about too to talk about these stories that no one talks about and you know yeah that was why mm -hmm. we wrote the book and, and you referenced a movie too um that yeah the woman oh, king i haven't seen i haven't seen the movie it's on me, my it's on it's on my watch list it's one of like things to watch me too yeah and so yeah when when i saw the when i saw the when i saw the thriller of the movie um the woman the woman king i hope we're not getting the name wrong <laughs> I, think, I think you're right but yeah 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 um i the, the the lead actress i watched her i watched her series um how to get away with murder i watched i watched yes, that's the one. yeah that, that's the lead actress in the movie <laughs> right and so when i when i watched it when i watched the trailer you know queen amina came into my mind i was like oh i was like i don't know if the storyline is actually from queen amina but this storyline really sounds like something that had happened 
Mm-hmm. So again, I'm not saying that that's where they got the storyline, but there's a lot of similarities between that and something that actually happened in history in Nigeria. I think what you're you're describing is um, you don't have to be a great warrior to be to win a war. You have to be a great leader. Yes, and that moves over in business too. And if women can see themselves as warriors, they can see themselves as successful in business too. Indeed, indeed, yeah. Because the business, wo- the business world is almost like a jungle. It's exactly. Like, it's a, yeah, it's just like yeah, you're, you're fighting different. It doesn't have to be fighting your competitors. Is you're fighting to keep the lights on. You know, yeah, you're fighting to pay um, um, to pay your workers or your contractors their their paycheck. Um, you're fighting to get health insurance for you know the people that work under you. You're, you're fighting to ensure that um, they can get a break and um, go for their vacations, right? And you know, like you know, like we said during our private conversation, um, no one is going to fight for your business the way you would fight for it. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, and so when you are getting into when you're starting a business, you know. The, the founder needs to realize that it's going to require lots and lots of sleepless nights. Right. And, it you is. know, yeah. And, you know, that is that is war. You know, you're, you're fighting to keep the lights on to the business is strong enough that then you can go to bed. Right. And the entrepreneur, uh, it, it, you know, sees the end game of the win in mind. They're not sure how. Yeah. Yeah. Keep that win in mind. Indeed. Yeah. You're not sure how it's going to work out. But right. uh, you, you're just like, yeah. One, one, one foot at a time. Totally. Well, I, I really appreciate your um, time uh, today. And so let's see, you, you told us about the business, um, the Beto Project and the first conference. So that's April 5th. And uh, so you, you said it's an aim to foster business creation and retention and give business students a platform to present their scholar, scholarly research, which is wonderful. Thank you for that. And then what, what, so what's your favorite business book? Uh, my favorite book is not actually a business book. I think my favorite book is actually an engineering book. <laughs> Funny, right? <laughs> uh, at least it's not a biology book. Because there you economists go. And, bio, and biologists are always having clashes back to back on what to do with an economy. Um, mine is by Don Newman, The Design of Everyday Things. And in his book, he talks about something called affordance. And when you when you when you talk about affordance, it's basically how do I design a project and make this project work with different sectors of the economy, right? So when we started, it's like okay, my foundation deals with economic growth, human capital, and development. I teach economics, data analytics, and entrepreneurship and venture capital. My colleagues and I were studying a business incubator and within the business incubator is studying a conference. So if you look at every, if you look at the design of what is going on, right, it's, they're always overlapping, but opening like economics of scope, economics of skill happening here simultaneously, right? Mm -hmm. Um, There were um, some group of students, I think four of them that walked up to me and they would come to my office to ask for business advice. And I was like, okay. I'm looking at my schedule and my time. This is not possible for me to keep doing this every time. So what I did was, okay, let's start a book club. So rather than you always coming to ask for advice, I w- we would recommend a book to read. And then once a month, we'll all talk about the book, right? So it's always because, you know, you've heard the saying, leaders are readers. So if you want to start a business, that means you're saying, I want to be a leader. If you're going to be a leader, you, you have to, you have to read you have to read multiple teams simultaneously at the same time. That's a really good, I love that. Leaders are readers. I had almost forgotten that phrase, but it's so true. You, you do have to read the right thing and you also have to to apply and execute. Yes, yes you it's have to apply just, and execute. It's not just about that reading, but well, um, so we're about to end our interview and I want to ask you, how can people get a hold of you? And I'm going to post this um the your foundation and all of your foundation website facebook twitter linkedin instagram and all of those things in this video at the in the link um but how can they get a hold of you personally through linkedin or email if they would like to do that and maybe a phone number too if you're okay um um the best way to reach me is um through linkedin dms i do read my linkedin dms um except for the the ones that that, that starts out as an ad <laughs> Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I do read those ones, but I don't reply to them. But 
and then um the baker university email address is on the baker university website that's another great way okay. to get me i do read that email a lot i usually tell people um you have to give me at least um 72 hours to reply okay perfect. and um or you can you can reach me out at um my research gates um profile the um research gate is, is well, how i describe research gate is like the facebook for researchers Oh, okay. Right. So, um, <laughs> when you read when you read academic papers, you look at um, Julian um, Julian Simon, um, one great economist. Um, you want to get in touch with Julian Simon. The best way to, to, to get in touch with him with research gate and send him a direct DM and ask him a question like, "Well, Julia, I, uh, Julian, I read this your this your statement on population and growth. I have this question to ask, and you know he would he would reply." Ooh. So, Thank yeah. you for that. I did not know about Yeah. That. So okay. so a lot of academics the best way to reach them is is research gates. Okay. Because good. that's where that's that's kind of like the academic Facebook where people talk about ask research questions and reply to each other back and forth. So that's the platform where academics exchange ideas. That makes sense. Yes, you did say that on there, but on, on here too. So research gate. Good. Great. Well, I want to I want to thank you, Gigi, very much for your time today. And I, I love your passion about your education and the foundation. I'm excited to um, you and I are going to be meeting uh, to I'm going to be participating in, in helping you with that. And I'm super excited. You yes. invited me to speak to your to your group um, at, at this conference, perhaps, or with, with your students. So I will end this interview and um, thank you very much for your time and what you're doing is wonderful and, and whatever you do, keep it up. Okay, thank you right, so thank much. You, I appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye.